specialize in working with startups and technology companies. One thing I do a lot of is discussions about classification, particularly for the on-demand, the gig economy companies. So that's what we're talking about today. Given the size of the group, I'm happy to answer questions during the presentation. We don't have to wait till this is all over. So if you have things as we're talking, please feel free to raise your hand and we can walk through it. So the, the goal here today is that you all understand what the legal framework is and then how to work within it. Right, I, I have a lot of clients, I have a lot of companies that get frustrated because us lawyers are always telling you you can't do things. And I am gonna tell you you can't do some, some things here, but then we're gonna work with some possible solutions to get the same results with still working within the framework. So just to give you kind of a basic why does this matter, uh, in the US, other countries are a little bit different um, depending on where you are. Any individual who's performing services is an employee or a contractor. They're in one of those two buckets. We don't have volunteers for for-profit companies, so they're gonna fall in those two. When you have employees, you get statutory protections, right? You get minimum wage, you get workers' comp, you get unemployment. Contractors, on the other hand, don't get those statutory protections, right? Because you're contracting to provide the service. You may contract for a bottle of wine to do something. You know, that's within your prerogative. There's none of those metrics that define this. So when we see all these lawsuits coming out, essentially what they're saying is this contractor should have been an employee. They should have been entitled to these statutory protections. So some of the risks, I like to start with the costs. So maybe people uh, <laughs> you pay a little bit more attention to the issue. You can have wage and hour class actions, right? If you have a large enough contractor base, those obviously get very expensive. You know, we can talk multi-million dollars on those depending on how many contractors you have. Um, and, and generally what we're looking at is unpaid minimum wage, unpaid overtime, meal and rest breaks that people didn't get. Individuals can also make claims for those, so it might not be a class action, they might just file an individual claim. The sort of forgotten piece is the taxes, right? So with employees, we're taking out payroll taxes. When we have people classified as contractors, we're not doing that, right? That's the whole point. We're paying them on a 1099. Government agencies don't necessarily particularly like that practice. So you get audits by the IRS. You get audits by the State Unemployment Division, which in California is the EDD. Uh, you can get audits from workers' comp departments to make sure that people are properly classified. Um, there's no particularly rhyme or reason as to why a government agency audits you. Right, I have clients who honestly barely use 1099s and have been audited. Maybe they've issued like 10 for the past three years and they got an audit. I have companies who issue lots and lots and lots of 1099s and have never gotten audited. So it's it's a little potluck, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, with some of the other legal actions, we can predict a little bit better <laughs> with disgruntled employees. With the audits, uh, it's a little tough to figure out when they're going to come down the pipeline. So the idea here is, how do we determine who's an employee and who's a contractor? Right. So in the state of California, the courts use what we call the right to control test. And keep in mind, if you have contractors who are in other states, not every state uses this test. Uh, there's modifications that look a lot like this test, and then there's ones that look a, a little bit more different. Uh, government agencies also tend to use modifications of this test that I would say tend to gear towards the side of being a little more employee friendly. They have a kind of a vested interest in determining people are employees because they're getting cash from it. So you can be a little bit behind the eight ball with the, with the audits. So in California, what we have here is, key here is who controls the manner and means of the work that's being performed. So we think of this as essentially, think of your contractor as a small business, right? They are a person who holds themselves out to do this type of work that they're doing, right? And that's why we're engaging them. Uh, you know, we also think who has the opportunity for profit or loss. You know, these are some of the metrics we want to, you know, come to mind here. So when we're thinking about this, these are some of the some of the framework, some of the factors uh, that courts will consider. You don't have to hit all of these. <laughs> this is a balancing test. 
So what we try to do when we're dealing with contractors, when we're dealing with these on-demand models who utilize a lot of them, we want as many of the factors in the contractor bucket as possible. So when we go through sort of these audits with clients, there's gonna be certain ones where you're gonna say, we can't do that, <laughs> right? We have to do it this way. And that's just gonna be, frankly, a drop in the employee bucket. We just want to make sure that we have more, and the things that are in the contractor bucket are more important. So, for instance, one of the things we think about, yeah. With this right to control test, how does this apply to interns? So, interns technically are employees um, so, in the two buckets. Okay, so like this summer, I had twelve interns at my company, and they were all working like full time. Yep. But I tend to need nine all of them. Should I not? It's <laughs> great question. I get this question a lot with interns. Interns, generally speaking, because you are heavily supervising them, in most cases, there might be interns that you're not, um, and I'm, I'm open to that being a possibility, but typically how internship programs work, you're going to be in the employee bucket. So we typically like to have them on a W-2. It sort of depends in what situation you're in. Sometimes 1099 is the only thing that's possible. And when we do that, what we want to do is we want to mitigate the risk. Right, because you have a person you're controlling a lot, <laughs> so we're already kind of in the employee bucket. So ways we mitigate risk is limit the time frame in which they're working. Right, so for an intern, you might have them there for three months, as opposed to a full year. You've now limited exposure, um, making sure they're making minimum wage for the hours they're working. Right, then you've cut off the minimum wage argument. Making sure they're working 40 hours a week and not over that, you can cut off some of those arguments. The other thing to do, make sure they're happy with the experience. Uh, like happy people don't bring claims. <laughs> happy people aren't gonna sue your company. So keeping, you know, making sure that people, especially when you're using interns, are getting something out of the experience. Yeah. And it's sort of the first sign of disgruntled, I'll say this with anybody, first sign of disgruntled employee or contractor, particularly contractors who probably should be employees, call your lawyer. Like, we can do a lot to mitigate on the first sign, but if we don't do something on the first sign, it can get complicated down the road. So, great question. Um, yeah, I guess, just to yeah. follow up on that, uh, so let's say we are gonna do, we do W2 them going forward, should they, are they entitled to the same benefits that full-time employees? So that depends. I will admit I'm not a benefits expert. Typically with temporary, um, they're not necessarily going to be. So it just depends. It's usually a call to your insurance provider first to say, hey, people are going to be here three months. They're going to be working X. A lot of these questions about benefits, like insurance and that kind of stuff, call your provider first. That's a free thing to do. <laughs> and if they don't know the answer, you know, call your attorney and ask them. So when we have this right to control test, uh, so distinct occupation. Again, the idea is these people are professionals who hold themselves out to do that. Um, we also have they don't work under direction or supervision, right? Again, they're controlling what they're doing. Um, one of the things here, the skill required. Prototypical contractors, we think again as professionals who have a specific skill set. I think as the on-demand and gig economy has evolved, we've seen more what we would have traditionally deemed unskilled labor being put into contractor buckets. And that may be something, for instance, if you have a delivery service company, if you have a cleaning company, where it's not necessarily a particular skill set, that may be something where you say, that's going to be in the employee bucket. We can't do anything about that. So how do we work with these other ones? We also think of contractors as providing their own equipment. Um, we're not providing a space. We're not providing tools for them. <laughs> Length of time, this one is, yeah. Uh, what if you provide tools to them, but they're optional? So that's better. So there's like a whole scan, like a whole spectrum of these things. Providing tools that are optional, good. Providing tools they have to pay for, it's just maybe a discounted rate that they're getting through you as opposed to having to buy them elsewhere, better. Because again, the idea is these guys own their own business, right? So they're, they're sinking a little bit of money into it, um, right? They have the opportunity for profit or loss here. So we like to shove some of those things over to them. On the flip side, when we talk risk, mitig risk mitigation, some of those things can be problematic, right? Because employees are entitled to reimbursement for business expenses. So that can be something that comes up in a lawsuit. But when we're thinking contractor model, I like to shove as much of the cost as possible 
onto the contractor. We can do discounted things, that kind of stuff, but we like to move that over there. Um, we also so, think, so you would yeah. say, let's say that the tools had a thousand dollar value, and our intention is to give the tools to them, but not require that they use them. Would you rather advertise it then that it's a thousand dollar value that's being discounted by a thousand dollars? Or it doesn't really matter? It doesn't really matter at that point, okay. right? Because they're still not paying for it. Okay. Um, so some of this you can get a little cute with. Ultimately, I don't know that that makes a difference. Got it. Um, length of time can matter, right? We think of employees as people who are there for indeterminate periods of time. Contractors tend, in the traditional sense, or project-based. It's expanded, obviously, so some of these things don't necessarily fit, but we do think of that. A um, method of payment can come into play hourly versus project-based. Um, relationship, can you terminate with or without notice? Um, if you can terminate without notice or with very little notice, that tends to be in the employee bucket. So we like to structure these contracts as time bound or like when the project is over, it terminates, like there's ways to work within that structure. Um, the other thing is, who, what is the relationship, <laughs> right? So for contractors, make sure you have a contract in place that says they're a contractor, right? It seems really, really basic and it's not gonna be determinative in terms of a lawsuit, but I've seen lots of people engage contractors where they have a contractor agreement that says, you are employed as a contractor. Sort of shoots me in the foot and we don't have a lot of defense there when you have a document like that. So just make sure you have a good contract agreement in place. Yeah. Because they use the word employee. Employed. Yeah, it's gonna, like I've seen a lot of people use they their- use the word hired. We don't like to use hired. Engaged is a good word to use for contractors. Contracted is a good one to use. Hire is sort of in the employee bucket. Now, don't get me wrong, um, we do interview contractors and I think sometimes when we talk about interviewing, that seems, that can sound like an employee thing to do. But if you're hiring, for instance, uh, someone to come and fix your kitchen, right, you're gonna interview them. <laughs> and that person's not your employee, that person's a contractor. So some of the language, I think sometimes we go a little bit overboard with saying we can't use any of the same language. But for contractors, I would say engage, contracted with, those types of things. And just making sure you have I say like a consistent good contractor agreement makes a big difference here. What if you yeah. were to require that they have certain thresholds of insurance coverage? That's a great one. Um, that's really because one of the things is, right, people aren't covered by workers' comp, so requiring certain thresholds of insurance is something that can be a positive in sort of the contractor bucket. Because again, it, it, it shows them as a business, right? They do this for other people, so that's why they carry the insurance. Can, can you require that they have a car? So it depends on what you're doing, right? Um, so for instance, right, if you're a, you know, if you're an Uber driver, <laughs> requirement that they have a vehicle in which to drive in, requiring that they have a driver's license, like those, when we think contractors, we think hands off for how they're performing the task. It doesn't mean we can't vet people, right? Like there's, I think it's gone sort of too far the other way where we're like, we can't require anything of a contractor. That's not true, right? We can require certain things. We can, for hiring a developer, right? We can require they have a specific skill set. Um, if we're hiring somebody to be a driver, we require them to have a driver's license. Like all this stuff we can do. In fact, sort of one of the ways to be hands on during the task is to be more hands on up front. Yeah, what about umbrella insurance? If you provide umbrella insurance, so yeah, that can cover yeah that can cover contractors depending on how the policy is. Okay, um, so the fact that you were doing that doesn't put you in risk. No, because it's just some umbrella coverage covers that, and depending yeah. on what space you're in, right. that might be a necessity. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the evolution of workers' comp? <laughs> it has been pretty crazy how like they're trying to cover like all of your contractors, and just what what do you as a lawyer like? We're is that like a way for them, for insurers to like upsell? Like I've talked to some I think so. like, we're only, we're, if you have contractors, we're only going to insure you if we're insuring all of your contractors, even if they're never going to work in your space and like the workers' comp would never sort of I, I think that's for sure one of the things, right? The insurance industry is always trying to find another hook. So I think that's definitely happening. Another thing that's happening is 
other countries, not every other country, but other countries do have a third space, right? They don't just have employee, they don't just have contractors. Like the UK has, I was talking to a UK attorney, it's like employee, contractor, worker. And workers get some of the benefits of being an employee, but they're more like a contractor. So like one of the benefits, I don't know if this is true in the UK, but one of the things that's been talked about in the US is do we need to create this third area where they get insurance, they get workers comp coverage, and they get unemployment, right? So they have those sort of baseline coverages. Um, because depending on what industry you're working in, workers comp matters more, <laughs> right? Um, if you're in an office, if you have developers, who cares about workers comp? If you have delivery drivers, workers comp matters a lot more. And you know, you do have some auto insurance and stuff that covers that. So it's interesting, and I think it's gonna continue to develop, because I've had customers um, for some of my um, gig economy clients who wanted to make sure that the company covered them on insurance because they didn't want <laughs> any of the legal recommend. No legal advice, of course. But. Um, in that situation, I said, look, we, we've done the determination of we feel they're properly classes, classified as contractors. It, it's on you to also do that determination because all, it was, it's a platform model, right? And so the customer was coming in and saying, we wanted somebody to come and perform a service for us. We weren't on site, we weren't dictating anything about what they were doing. Customer may have now have an employee relationship with those people. So that's on them to figure out if they need umbrella coverage, not on us to figure out. And it, right, when you're trying to sell, it can be tough. <laughs> so having some sort of extra like umbrella coverage is something I've seen some folks do recently. Or, a lot of people, one thing that helps with contractors is if they have their own business entity and you contract with the business entity instead of the individual. So for instance, with EDD audits, um, the, every EDD auditor I've worked with, like knock on wood, says, I don't even want to look at 1099s for businesses. I just want to look at 1099s issued for individuals. So it's one way to mitigate risk by having them have a business set up. And then they can get their own insurance, those types of things, just depending on what they do. Yeah? I see on one of the specs it talks about how uh, Austin is not, it's basically going to have non compete. Um, yeah. Is that like a hard and fast thing? Because we, we have this, this, even in the password credit. to like a marketing contractor who's legitimately yep. a contractor with their yep. business, but we have an interest in making sure that they don't go take all our marketing. Absolutely. Intel. So, one, non-competes in California are prohibited after the termination of the contract. So you can only have non-competes during the term of service. It's the same with employees. We can only, it's a really small space in which we can do it. Yeah. For one-off contractors, I don't have an issue necessarily with restricting in certain situations. It's something that tends more towards an employee, right, because we're restricting what they're doing, but there's some spaces where it makes sense. When we have mass amounts of contractors, for instance, we have delivery service drivers, during that, we don't want to restrict that. They should be able to do whatever they want. For individual contractors, I'm fine making that determination. I would not do it as a practice for every single one because it doesn't matter for every contractor, but it would definitely you know, take a look at whether it matters. Okay. Um, so just quickly here, um, Lawson v. Grubhub was kind of the first of the gig economy that actually went to trial. Um, the judge actually decided Lawson was properly classified as a contractor, which I think surprised some of us. Um, really spent a lot of time focusing on how they didn't control how we made deliveries, didn't control the appearance, never looked at his car, didn't dictate anything about uniform, didn't tell him he ever had to sign up for a schedule. I think, in fact, this guy went two months while he was a contractor without ever signing up for a schedule. So the judge was very moved by those types of things. Um, there was also a... The guy didn't have any credibility. He was basically cheating Grubhub out of money. <laughs> and more or less, I, I don't know that he perjured himself on the stand, but was not credible on the stand. And not to say that was a huge motivating factor in this decision, but I do think having a credible, likable plaintiff makes a difference here. Because right, he's trying to say they're dictating all these things I'm doing, 
and the judge wasn't buying it, right? Because um, he, he lied on numerous kind of small things that didn't matter. So when we think we, of these contract clauses, yeah. how powerful is the termination? Yeah, so old Supreme Court cases in California said termination at will or with very short notice periods is an employee. Like that makes them an employee. I mean, considering other factors, but that's a strong factor in employee. This judge, he had a contract that you could terminate within 14 days. This judge said, look, that's a factor, right? I see that, because termination at will is kind of an employee. But it matters what the situation is. So in cases, the FedEx cases, there's lots of litigation over whether FedEx drivers were employees or contractors. In the FedEx cases, they invested a ton of money, right? They had to buy a FedEx truck. They had to buy routes, right? They invested a lot in this. So the idea that they could be terminated at will tended towards the idea that they were employees. The judge here said, he hasn't invested anything. Like he maybe bought like a hot bag to keep the food hot while he's driving, but that's it. So it doesn't matter in this situation, right? Like it is an employee factor, but everything else was so far in the contractor category, it wasn't as important. So we're moving, I think, one, I think we're moving towards a situation where people are a little more open to the contractor models. I think we're moving to a situation where companies are getting savvier with how to treat contractors, um, right? Like when Uber first started, I, they had like basically a guide they handed their, their drivers that said, this is the Uber experience, right? This is what you do. You drive this kind of car, you have this kind of music on, you do this. That obviously makes them look like employees, right? Because it's very directed there. We have started to learn, right? And I think as companies enter into the space, utilize contractors more, but they're getting much savvier as to, no, 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 we can't hand out employee handbooks, essentially, to contractors. <laughs> That's gonna make them, you know, into the employee space. So, the thing I encourage, okay, the thing I encourage when you're thinking about this and utilizing contractors, don't spend so much time thinking about what you can't do. Um, forwarding, right? Don't think about what you can't do. Spend more time thinking about what you want, like the end result to be, and how you can get to that, right? Because there's hands off ways to get to certain end results without dictating everything people are doing, right? So for instance, you have, you want deliveries done in X amount of time. One way you can achieve that is telling people they have to do that. Another way you could achieve that is potentially incentivizing customers to tip, right? Customers who are tipping are probably getting their deliveries faster. You'd have to obviously work out the analytics to see if that's true, but incentivizing customers to tip Tipping customers, drivers making more, drivers will be incentivized to continue that behavior. So thinking about some more hands-off approaches for ways you can get to the same thing. And then, yeah, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I was going to ask about branding. So for example, yeah. when an Uber car picks me up, there's an Uber thing that's partly for security yeah, and a lot yeah. of other things. If you're producing content or if you're delivering something, like how how is it if you're if the person that is on behalf of your marketplace is wearing or did something with your brand or the lines? So one, we don't want to require it. Um, that was one of the things in the Grubhub case. He had a T-shirt, but he wasn't required to wear it. Um, it's hard to bring right? We want to think about one, making it optional for sure. Two, thinking about how do I brand other portions of the business. Right, how do I brand my interface? How do I brand our interaction with the customer? How do I brand things that aren't this person? And, and what about this? I mean, just asking them to wear a pin when they go to your jobs versus a competitor's jobs. Yeah, That's things like that required. where it's a little bit minor. So all of this is in a difficult space. There are no like right and wrong answers necessarily. There are certain things that are wrong um, and certain things that are 100% right, but everything else sort of moves in the gray area. And so you want to, it's honestly a creative exercise, right? Like think about what you want to do and then again encourage you talking with legal counsel and playing out how that would work. Because I have a lot of clients who say, look, we want to do this. And I'm like, let me think about that. <laughs> right? Let me think about how that's going to look and how that's going to play out and other things we might be able to do. I think we can, yeah. Did you say there was a difference between 14 days or 
immediate termination? Not really. If it's termination within a very short period of time, it's, it's essentially the same. As long as it's mutual. Yeah, as long as it's mutual. Thanks, everyone.